Hello, good evening everybody. It's your happy, healthy Dr. Alicia. I am coming to you live today where I'm going to be um, chatting it up with my good friend, um, Katie Ann Rattre, who's a nurse practitioner. So we're just going to wait for her to come on. Hi, everybody. Hello. Welcome. Okay, so she'll be in it. This will be a nice little girlfriend's chat for this gloomy Friday. Hopefully it's not so gloomy where you guys are tonight. Oh, perfect. I'm on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I struggle with this stuff. <laughs> How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Well, you made it on. So you just, oh, it's like, I did. Win-win. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Okay, well, thank, thank you, for you so having much me. For, joining, for having this conversation with me on Friday. Uh, first, let me just check in with you. How, how'd your week go? Because, you know, um, <laughs> I think they said that Mercury's retrograde. Yeah. And um, whatever that means, I was experiencing it. So <laughs> it, was a busy, <laughs> it was a busy one. Busy, yeah. busy, busy. And just lots of hiccups. Things didn't seem to go the way it's supposed to. But, well, the way I wanted it to. But I guess the way it's supposed to. But all is well. How about you? Yeah. How was your week? You know, I was just feeling kind of like tired this week. I don't know. I just couldn't muster the energy, I feel. Um, uh -huh. But, you know, some weeks are better than others. So, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it was know. indeed busy as well. Um, it's really yeah. nice because, um, as you know, this week I was able to kind of get out um, a piece of writing that I, uh, that I published about my birth experience, which oh is something gosh. I had been like carrying for a long time, but I hadn't quite told that story in the intimate detail um, in which it happened. So that was actually kind of nice to kind of get all this positive feedback and also just a lot of women reaching out and saying like, wow, this sounds like my experience. And, you know, the crazy part is most of these women are like pro professional women, you know, so it wasn't mm -hmm. um, people who were with insurance, people who wouldn't have traditional risk factors for having you know, experience racism in healthcare, adverse outcomes. But um, I think that part was good to kind of just release that because it, yeah, it had been kind of like following me a little bit like a dark cloud um, yeah. and I, feeling like I needed to really tell that story properly. So yeah. that part was, I think, a highlight. <laughs> well, I want to say I read the article and just like the ladies that are reaching out to you, that was my story too. I think it's so many of our stories and mm -hmm. the fact that you, one, are a doctor and two, are a woman of color, black woman and experiencing the same thing. And like you said, you're carrying it. It just gives us a little bit of relief. Like, yeah, I'm not crazy. I'm not being sensitive. This really was my experience. This really, yeah. it's validated, like even her you know yeah um, that's a medical professional so I think that was it was a well-written article first of all and it was so relatable so thank you for sharing that um because you. You, you release your burden and ours too <laughs> <laughs> yes thank Seriously. you so much thank you so much it's crazy because it it took me a quite some time to even come to the realization that this was happening to us you know uh, because it's not really something that's traditionally taught in school like yes they're you know, we're always kind of taught that, yes, you treat everybody equally. There's a very kind of cold, calculated way that you see people, you treat people, you deal with people. But the idea that people could be, like, there could be inequity or differences in the way that you treat and see individuals and how you even hear the information that they're telling you and processing right. that and making decisions around that can be totally right. different. Even though the case might be the same, it might be totally different just based on the person's race, you know, or the, the mm -hmm. person's gender or their, their, you know, sexual orientation, or even if they have money or don't have money, how they right. present, you know, if they present with like Gucci bag, then somehow that like, <laughs> I mean, right? you know what I mean, you know what I mean? I, so I, I like, do, I do. And I think like, you know, I think from the other perspective, I don't, I bet you that many of those that are being biased don't even realize it it's so yeah. it's not even conscious sometimes you know and that gucci bag or you didn't flash your credentials but that just kind of resets 
you know, they're like, okay, let me just do it a little bit different. They don't even realize that it's happening. So right. um, I definitely think that they're thinking that they are being, um, they are following those, uh, those codes of conduct of t t treating people um, mm -hmm. equally. But obviously, if we, so many of us are experiencing it, we're not receiving what they're giving us in that way. Right, exactly. Yes, girl, so that was my week. But let me give you a proper introduction, my friend, because your fun. credentials are amazing. <laughs> um, so this is my dear friend, Katie Ann Retre, everyone. She's an inner healer coach and also <laughs> a board certified psychiatric nurse practitioner. Mm -hmm. She has a master's <laughs> degree in counseling and also is using her personal journey with trauma in conjunction with her professional background to be a guide for those who are on the path to inner healing and don't we all need a little inner healing especially on Girl. this movie friday with mercury Girl. and retrograde <laughs> that's right right we, healing is an ongoing process it never ends, right? you need healing um, i need healing we all need a little bit of healing amen <laughs> yes amen so i'm just so happy to be having this conversation with you just around um you know just in light of kind of what i wrote i feel like it's a very timely conversation to have um about um, parenthood about mistrust and about this issue of medical bias and how it is that both of us similarly have, you know, really used our stories to inform our practice as health professionals and how that's really kind of, you know, I, for me in the article stating that it, it has made me a better doctor because I'm able to ally myself that much more closely with my patients and you really see yourself in them. And I don't really know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, you know, from a therapeutic point of view. <laughs> but I can get your opinion on that too. But I guess it's kind of a way for me to kind of to stay allied with them and to kind of right. be able to see them in a in a way that's very much humanistic as opposed to this cold calculated way that I had to kind of undo that that kind of training in my mind around, right. you know. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think yeah, I think being empathetic is what you're saying, you know, like you really are understanding how it feels, even if your circumstance is different from theirs, mm -hmm. you know what it feels like to feel invisible, mm -hmm. right? So you know the, the subtle things that were done um, to do that, that make you feel that way. So it just makes you a bit more conscious to say, hey, um, I do need to get these this note done, but I still need to just look at them when they're telling me something that's emotional, mm. right? Um, so yeah, I definitely think having empathy is so essential. And I don't know if it's been like that for you, but I know for me um, in practice, when I, you know, when I was in practice, just my presence just gave patients a sense mm. of relief. You know, yes. like mm -hmm. they feel like mm -hmm. there's a possibility that they're going to hear and see me for more than just my diagnoses, right? Mm -hmm. They're going to hear mm -hmm. and understand my story. So I think that there is a big responsibility that you carry, um, um, you know, as a healthcare professional, as a doctor um, that is Black, and we're looking towards you because you understand, you know? Yeah. Um, Many Absolutely. Levels. And I think even more for mental health, um, just because, you know, there is such a huge critical shortage of mental health providers. And because of this, like, uh, you know, this burden that we carry, you know, in terms of, um, you know, with in terms of trauma, past traumas that we carry, depression, anxiety, the way that I think um, culturally that we have dealt with that has often been to kind of repress and suppress those things and to not really deal with them head on. Um, what do you feel like is the impact of that in terms of how we then in turn uh, process these very momentous moments in our life, like, for example, pregnancy or motherhood or when it's, like, how, how do you feel like that kind of plays into it when we carry these kind of deep negative emotions and suppress them while we're yeah. trying to transition or move into to very important phases in our life. Right. If that makes sense. That's, yeah, that's a great question. I think that, um, I think that um, first just, I think it's so multi-layered, you know, mm -hmm. I think in, in cultures, black cultures, I'm Caribbean, the idea of seeking mental health has, you know, it's 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 so negative. It's a mm -hmm. sign of weakness. You should be strong, and or you know, you're lacking faith. You know, if you mm -hmm. have 
um, any signs of sadness or depression or anxiety. That's the devil. So, mm -hmm. you know, you were kind of conditioned to um, disregard your emotions. And mm -hmm. the thing is that it's almost like a volcano. You can take as much, you could ignore it as much as possible. And then this small little thing happens and then you explode, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's one thing. And then, so just imagine carrying all of that and then being pregnant. And this was a little, literally my story, you know, from mm -hmm. the outside, everything is okay. But inside, mm -hmm. and it's not even that I thought that I was lying, you know, mm -hmm. you just think, I'm bigger than everything that's happening to me. I'm fine, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Here's the external evidence of my fineness, right? Mm -hmm. um, of me being okay. So then you get pregnant and hormones are changing and things that I was able to suppress were not as easily, um, it wasn't as easy to do. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, for me, it was a really difficult time emotionally during my pregnancy. And I remember I wasn't in mental health um, at this point. I was practicing as a nurse, a critical care nurse. Um, I did have a master's in counseling, but even with that, um, I didn't have a, um, uh, I wasn't a psych NP and I didn't have much mental health um, experience um, mm -hmm. in, the, in, the, in the hospital um, but I knew something was wrong and I knew that I was crying a lot and I mm -hmm. knew that I felt overwhelmed mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. I couldn't be depressed you know like I just don't get depressed like who, who you know I'm just having a hard time mm -hmm. um, and it became so challenging and I actually did therapy is not something that's new for me um, mm -hmm. but at that point um, it, it was different you know I really couldn't handle it um, so I actually sought out therapy when I was pregnant, um, but I was so ashamed to like uh, use my insurance or I don't know. I don't know why I had used therapy before, but there was a shame that I had. Mm -hmm. So I found this uh, research study that was happening. Um, well, it found me and I was like, oh, my goodness, this is perfect. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I went in there and it was a major hospital affiliated with a, uh, a university. And mm -hmm. I went in and um, I answered the question very like I was like, I, I don't know. I feel I feel like it's a 10, but I don't want to say 10. So I'm going to say mm -hmm. six. Right. So mm -hmm. at the end, she's like, oh, you don't qualify. Right. Like it was so dismissive. It was like, oh, you don't qualify, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know, and there was really no resources for me. And I was like, um, I just I just left. Um, and uh, I did not um, seek any additional support um, in the mental health field and in the, in the in the mental health um, world during my pregnancy. Um, but it was really mm -hmm. hard because I feel holistically is how I practice. And I feel like all the emotions that I'm carrying, you know, my child is living in that experience. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. She's mm -hmm. living in anxiety. She's living in sadness. So I definitely believe that it's a it can be a very contributing factor um, to the health of the fetus, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of times when patients come and they said, hey, I'm pregnant, should I continue treatment? When I'm weighing risk and benefits, I'm not just weighing whether or mm -hmm. not the medication is going to hurt the fetus, but what about your depression? How will that mm -hmm. affect the baby, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I definitely think that there needs to be um, sensitivity within the um, healthcare field to screen women for, pre uh, for depression Mm -hmm. And especially women of color to give them permission to say that I really am feeling a 10 of sadness and not a four. You know, yeah. This is really heavy for me. Right. Um, just give them permission to say that and um, recognizing that, um, you know, there needs to be more resources for me um, or excuse me, for us. Um, when mm -hmm. I left that study, it was you don't qualify and that was it. But I was still in a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. It seems very odd that they would use a one to 10 scale to try to a subjective scale, especially for something like depression or anxiety. It is obviously something that's subjective, right? That's something you feel that can't necessarily be measured. But if someone is saying, I'm feeling depressed, that should really be enough to be able to plug them into care and into services, right? I know we have these these scales now that we use, like PHQ nines and things like that, um, which can certainly be helpful because the questions are far more specific that you're asking about emotions like sadness, depression, are you crying? Like, 
you know, issues with your appetite and sleep, you know, come kind of some of these physiologic things that start to happen when people manifest depression, anxiety, and, and severe, you know, chronic stress. But it, it's just very odd to me because, you know, depending on how people perceive, you know, the depression, they may say, no, it's actually not that bad, even though they're actually feeling very bad. Um, but then they don't get help, which doesn't, right. you know, that kind of defeats the purpose, right? Like you miss a, a critical opportunity to provide m a much needed service to someone who you, it could be really ailing, like potentially, you know, suicidal, potentially wanting to hurt themselves, you know, wanting to hurt their family, or their children, you know, really in a state of stress. And so right. I, I totally agree with you. It's, it's, it's super important. I don't recall being asked any questions in my pregnancy about being depressed. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, no, I didn't either. Um, and this again was outside of my, uh, I had a midwife, this was outside uh -huh. of that. It was like a, a study that was happening mm -hmm. um, that was not connected. And I also want to okay. say, like, I say this to a lot of my patients, like my black patients and either my, my, my black and his Latino patients or just patients of color, like, depression could look so different for us. Absolutely. You know, yeah. it manifests, especially like it manifests as anger, you know, because mm -hmm. it's more acceptable for us to be angry. Mm -hmm. um, where, you know, it, it feels less vulnerable for us to be angry. Mm -hmm. So you know, some of those um, questions don't always correlate with what we see depression as. And right. um, again, it's like the baseline, like, oh, uh, you know, like I can handle this, you know, um, mm -hmm. it's just when you're carrying a heavy load for so long, you don't really, you don't even know how heavy it is. Yeah. yeah. And also to, to just add to that, also, I feel like depression can manifest in us as just withdrawal, you know, yeah. uh, where you're just caring so much, you're just trying to get through the day, you know, that lack of connection, that lack of eye contact, that lack of you know, um, I don't know, that that oomph that yeah. you feel when someone is like in a good place, you feel that energy from them. Like as somebody who's, you know, an empath and who does like register energy from others. But, you know, I think in some cases that's kind of where racism comes in and bias where you're seeing someone and then you're, you're not actually viewing them as, a, as fully human in your mind subconsciously and so that and you don't even register that energy or there's this subconscious fear like well is this person angry at me or what is she angry at or why is she behaving this way as opposed to you know yeah i've had a lot of um interactions with patients that have presented in a way that was kind of very um what would people would perceive as angry i don't like to call it angry because I really like to kind of sit and de deconstruct what it is that person is feeling. But, you know, in many cases, it has a lot to do with their experiences in healthcare in the past, <laughs> especially when they've come to doctors and tried to explain what it is that they're feeling and they've been disregarded and have felt uh, disempowered. And so that, that kind of anger is really just a mask that they carry um, a vulnerability in trying to protect themselves. So, you know, really giving people the benefit of the doubt that that's likely not that. We should just, like, try to treat this person with respect and then let me try to talk with them and see what their experience has been and what I need to learn about their experience so that they can feel more comfortable being open about their issues, right? Yeah, absolutely, 100%. I think um, that was my experience in practice on both ends, you know, when I was mm -hmm. sitting on both ends of the table. Mm -hmm. um, it, yeah, so I think that, um, and it's a good point. Like, I know from my own self, um, maybe not in practice, but just in life, I realize that I view things or an experience from from my own understanding of the way things look. And that mm -hmm. might not be what the person is translating. Mm -hmm. So similarly, like when we make these assumptions um, about um, a patient's behavior, um, you know, we really don't give them the opportunity. I love that you say, you know, I like to deconstruct what that is. Mm -hmm. you know? um, and it may be angry, it may be anger, but it may have nothing to do with you, you know, yeah. angry about something that just happened and they can't even, you know, focus on whatever is happening. So just right. at the end of the day, people just want to be heard, you know, right. patients want to be heard. Um, Absolutely. And felt, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think at the um, 
on the other end of that is kind of where the mistrust comes in, right? When you're not feeling valid validated, when you feel disempowered. Um, yeah. In your experience in working with uh, patients of color, do you find that like this issue of medical mistrust, um, especially for people who are living with chronic disease or have to like interface with healthcare on a regular basis, um, like what, if any, any things that you've identified that patients kind of bring to you as like issues in even seeking care? Yeah. Or potential so barriers there's a few for them. So I want to say, um, I'm going to, there. before I, I answer that, I want to preface like this, this thing, this say this, like, so when we make a diagnosis, when mm -hmm. I make a mental health diagnosis is based off of the DSM-5 mm -hmm. and every uh -huh. single um, category of the DSM-5 of talking about mood or anxiety, it gives you a list of criteria that the patients have to meet. And every one of them says, um, if this is within, like, it, it, um, if it's outside of the patient's cultural norm, right? Mm -hmm. um, and what I found is that patients have been missed. I was on, on uh, in a group and I was just venting uh, mm -hmm. sometime last year that there is these diagnoses that are so inappropriate to patients. Mm -hmm. Patients are being diagnosed with psychosis when it's really PTSD. Mm -hmm. um, and things that they describe as psychosis is so culturally relevant, right? Mm -hmm. So they're diagnosing them based upon their cultural experience and not taking in consideration the patients. Mm -hmm. So then there's this mistrust that the patients are, what I find is patients are hesitant to say much about anything, right? Like, because mm -hmm. they don't want to be branded as crazy. Mm -hmm. So a patient of mine is like, you know, her dog, or her family died and um, she's from, she's Latina and, you know, she's seeing them in, you know, in life um, mm -hmm. and in her dreams. Um, and that's a big, that's such reverence, you know, mm -hmm. in the culture, mm -hmm. cult culture and other assessments shows that she's fine. So she has a psychotic um, di a, a diagnosis that I, I can't remember what it was, but it wasn't appropriate for her. It had something to do with psychosis because mm -hmm. of that fact. Um, and I also see, like, um, I think that um, some of the patients have been diagnosed with, like, bipolar or mania because mm -hmm. they're having um, a, 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 an episode of behavior or because they're, you know, that's that's not what mania looks like just right. because they're their energy or temperament or the way they handle things is different. There's specific categories. So I think what I see from patients is this mistrust, mm -hmm. um, almost like, let me, how much do I say, right? Because if I say this, you may do, you know, you may put this diagnosis down, which mm -hmm. may impact my life, you know, on many different levels. But mm -hmm. if I don't say anything, I'm still going to get treated inappropriately. Um, so mm -hmm. it's like a double edged, edged sword mm -hmm. um, so that's one thing. Um, and another thing that I think I hear consistently um, from patients is like, you know, they don't feel like they have, and this may not have anything necessarily to do with the provider mm -hmm. or the, the providers have very little control, but there's certain things that we can do. Um, and um, they feel like they don't have time. They're like, mm -hmm. this is just a drive through, you know, they're like, fine, yeah. everything's fine. Like, why bother? I'm just here because I got to be here. Um, but nothing is really happening. Um, mm -hmm. So that's what I've consistently heard. Um, and I also think that another thing is um, that I hear from patients is like, you know, when we say noncompliance, it's really important yeah. for me to understand what does that mean? Mm -hmm. Like, if a patient is, I think about Maslow hierarchy of needs, and maybe... Mm -hmm maybe that's the next level they haven't satisfied the first level you yeah. know so when you're talking about a patient that's in and out of shelter mm -hmm. compliance with this medication is not going to be priority so we really yeah. have to understand what is what is valuable to them at this time to kind of make an alliance so we can um help them you know um get their needs satisfied so that we can help stabilize them and help them to be compliant with the treatment and sometimes patients are not compliant because um, there's a side effect that they're embarrassed to talk about the sexual mm -hmm. side effect, mm -hmm. um, and they don't they don't feel comfortable um, talking about that because they feel they're going to be judged or mm -hmm. so that 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 space that I can um, you know tell you without judgment what's going to happen what's happening to me is all isn't always felt. 
Right. You're absolutely right. I love that you bring that up because the issue of the diagnoses and how that, you know, some of the way that we perceive some of the behaviors can be very cultural. Uh, when you were speaking about that, particularly like bipolar, which you kind of see these diagnoses very, it seems commonly assigned to people. I'm like, this is, uh, it's just odd to me that like so many people from the same neighborhood have these diagnoses of bipolar. Um, but the other diagnosis that was coming to my mind was borderline personality uh, disorder, which I also see kind of assigned to most often black women uh, quite frequently. And I just wanted to ask your take on, um, cause you did mention a little bit about kind of some of the environment and the social determinants of health that we often don't take into consideration, like how much that really plays into some of these behavioral traits that may manifest as mental illness. Like, you know, somebody being impoverished their whole life or somebody having food insecurity uh, or somebody, you know, having to engage in, you know, uh, exchanging sex for whatever, survival sex, uh, for example, or individuals who, you know, have to in engage with systems and it's just horribly degrading for them to do so every single time because it's treated with such disrespect. Um, so, I mean, so many things, right? Housing instability, um, all of these things that really kind of contribute poor family structure, social supports, um, you know, even kind of being banned or barred from systems uh, themselves, like educational systems or, you know, even criminal justice systems, that kind of thing. So how much does that like play into some of these diagnoses, even though it, you know, it play into some of the behaviors, I should say that are used to make these diagnoses. And if you think that's appropriate at times, or if it's just really an issue of this person having been the victim of systemic racism in our country, and this is just a natural kind of manifestation of what someone experiences, which is just awful for them. And it's kind of become more of a protective mechanism. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I'll say this, um, the person that, is giving the diagnoses has a lot of power mm -hmm. and it's it's really important to understand where their frame of mind is so mm -hmm. if there's a patient that's difficult for mm -hmm. them mm -hmm. they can then justify the behaviors that they're demonstrating for it to fit borderline personality disorder mm -hmm. right so it does take you as a provider to be objective and put your feelings aside and i don't think everybody can do that and I definitely think that in my experience that there are people that are treating people that hasn't really treated them their own selves, right? Yeah. So they're bringing their own biases, even if they're the same race, into these diagnoses, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that's so important that we as mental health providers take care of our own selves because then we can't even see how our stuff is coming in and impacting um, a patient. Because mm -hmm. I can not really appreciate or not look forward to a particular patient because of whatever reason but that doesn't mean that they're by their 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 borderline personality mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. uh, and, and that diagnosis is really i think something that i um definitely um try to um, avoid mm -hmm. um, putting down until you've had a long history with the patient and mm -hmm. or, you know, multiple people have had similar, um, you know, interactions and there's interpersonal conflicts and mm -hmm. all of that type of thing. So I definitely think that um, the lens of, of who's putting the name or the diagnosis on a mm -hmm. patient is really important. And I've been in um, situations where I'm reading what the social, you know, I, I don't want to, I'm not saying it's social workers or it's psychiatrists or NP, but whomever put it there. And I'm like, what mm -hmm. the hell? Like there was this guy that was diagnosed with schizophrenia. He came out, he was in prison um, uh, for like eight years. He got, uh, I think, 40 or 60 years on drug charges. And because of the changes with the Rockefeller law, he got out in eight years, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, he's obviously very anxious. And there were things that happened. This was a nonviolent crime mm -hmm. that he mm -hmm. spent most of his life in jail for. His mom died and while he was in jail. His, and a couple other family members died when he was in jail, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. 
he has he at that point had only begun to share a little bit of what his experience was like so you better believe that he's going to have some you know um some reaction when he comes out um he's going to be hearing things but we have to assess why is that happening mm-hmm. right it's very easy to say that psychosis and i was so annoyed with it cuz this guy's been out of prison for 6 7 months he's never had any psychiatric hospitalization mm-hmm. he um you know he started hearing the voices after prison you know or while in prison never before mm-hmm. and he's in his 30s at this point right like we have to start putting things together and be like all right you know this is not really it's a frenia and he's without meds for 6 months he's really relatable you know um there's no way that he can be schizophrenic you know right. and he's just telling me that the meds that he was on was just making him tired yeah. he just felt depressed so um you know i was i was so annoyed about that and you know i changed the diagnoses and i put some things in the notes like this you know whatever i put in the notes to like this is not this is not schizophrenia mm-hmm. um so i definitely think that sometimes providers may not have the time when a patient's transferred to you mm-hmm. to really hear their story and you continue on a path that doesn't serve the patient mm-hmm. um and i think that there's some of our own biases that is that comes into it mm-hmm. um and when it comes so i think that if you're able to set aside your biases then you can really use a dsm-5 and decipher and there shouldn't be such discrepancy with mm-hmm. the diagnoses there might be maybe the patient doesn't tell you something that's pertinent you know maybe it's a one time if you don't get clarifying information i could understand but just not the amount there's just too many patients that are just bipolar like you said just just too many yeah, and <laughs> yeah this is not bipolar you know, you know? yeah exactly oh, yeah i mean i think yeah. kind of going back to what you said at the beginning i'm sure it's extremely helpful that you're a woman of color and you know he probably feels like he's finally being listened to and validated so he can start to open up uh to you about some of these very traumatic things that have taken place in his life including his experience in jail which is extremely traumatic for people and one of the reasons why people never get rehabilitated because it's not a place for rehabilitation right it's usually just re-traumatizing people and <laughs> putting them in a in a position especially when it comes to mental health and they don't get like the care they need. So it's yeah. I think it's am- amazing that you know you're kind of positioned right now to be able to help people who who really 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 need it. Yeah. So yeah. No, I was just going to go to our audience. Um Oh, oh okay. <laughs> just <laughs> just to just check in with everybody who's still with us. Um to say hello. Uh we have Renee Lovely. Um of course Jossie's in the house joining us. Um uh, we have yeah. some other folks here. Um I just wanted to read through some of the comments perhaps uh for UK you can answer. Um so Renee Lovely had wrote uh yay many members of the of her family are full native american and african american and they've experienced differences in care. Absolutely. I mean this is you know so much uh academic research it's published in just about every academic jur- uh, you know discipline around kind of racism in healthcare this is a real thing and i'm glad that we're kind of finally talking about this in a real meaningful way and it's yeah. kind of gaining traction with uh, this whole black lives matter movement um we have yaya c64 uh let's see and she's agreeing with your assessment of being like anger and defensive um let's see all right oh and maybe the comment that sometimes people you fe- have a feeling of being forced to diagnose people um which is tied to a systemic obligation to do that and also tied to a timeline what are your thoughts on that so i think that there's so many um there's so many things that need to be de- deconstructed like you know the re- and that's why i said sometimes providers are doing the best they can you know mm-hmm. depending upon the environment that you work in mm-hmm. you know that you have a limited amount of time so how mm-hmm. do you give quality and quantity uh with with the time that you have it's not mm-hmm. always easy right? right so a patient might have a lot of complexity um but if you take that time you know um that every patient really do need then you're going to be backed up 
um, and or you're not going to, you know, reach the quota for the clinic if you're working in one to continue to sustain itself. Yeah, so that so sad. Is not gonna... So it's really so complex. I mean, the insurance, um, even just the insurance situation is really frustrating. And sometimes, um, you know, in, in, in the defense of the providers that are putting the bipolar, sometimes medications um, for patients that have been persistently depressed, they won't approve it, you know, yeah. and it's an easier process to approve. Um, and I'm not suggesting that this is what is done, but, you know, maybe the patient isn't hey. depressed. So you, you, you have to sometimes finagle things to get yeah. the patient to where they need to, to get be. them what they need yeah i mean yeah. sometimes you have to kind of play play the yeah. system a bit to get people what they need to get things covered yeah. to get things paid for yeah i mean yeah. I, i've definitely seen that a lot for sure yeah uh, because yeah. insurance companies have so much power to determine the type of care we render and even if you spend you know an hour with someone they're like well if you didn't have x y and z in your note then we're only going to pay you for like a 10 minute visit you know yeah. so yeah. Uh, all of this time and effort is kind of wasted right and then yeah. you know you have these productivity quotas that you have to meet um because unfortunately we work in a fee-for-service system that's not really based on quality where that's not you know that's not the focus of the visit or people coming to the doctor it's really just to right. kind of get them in and out like you get paid for five minutes the same you get paid for an hour Right. right. So mm. and That's with the that. overbooking and the triple booking and the whatever, you know, it's like, okay, you just yeah. try to do the best you can. Yeah. I mean, our system. Yeah. So really I think broken. that's a good point. Like, you know, sometimes, you know, providers can only do the best that they can do. And they're, yeah. they're doing, they're trying their best to maneuver and support you in a broken system right mm -hmm. um and sometimes the patients may not feel that they're getting what they're needing because we really our hands are tied yeah. and then it goes back to you know do you sacrifice yourself which you know when i first started that's what was happening and yeah. then i don't become i'm no good for my patients anyhow so it's a, it's a double edged sword and i think ultimately there needs to be a lot of things within the healthcare system that um changes um, yeah. and i love the fact that you um talked about like you know you just said like especially with the black lives matter i love that they're talking about like black mental health matters like mm -hmm. even you know even the people that are you know, um, spearheading the Black Lives Matter. There's a level of energy, um, uh, just a level of just emotional drainness that, you know, without even without a diagnosis can mimic, you know, symptoms similar to depression. Mm -hmm. um, and they may not need medication, but they need someone to talk to. So mm -hmm. um, I think the current system doesn't support m most of us whether whatever you wherever you are along the socioeconomic status yeah i agree we have another really interesting comment from yaya c64 thank you for your comment ma'am she would love to hear about all black and brown providers medical clinical opening up a hospital clinic or a clinic where cultural sensitivity is embedded Yes, let's do that. I mean, I don't even need to, we don't even need to do no cultural sensitivity, like just being in our skin. Yeah. You know, we're not our experience. Like, yeah. Yeah, we're not this life. <laughs> yeah. You know, like I get it. I get you're angry, you know. I'm angry too. So I and Me I too. get that you are. <laughs> exactly. I'm down with that. I definitely think we do yeah. that. I think we I'm I'm all about I don't I don't really like to build on a broken system and I'm just like yes. let's just walk away from this and yeah. create something of our own. I don't know yeah. how that would look, um, but I definitely think it's something that's needed. I think that more people would feel comfortable going. I mean, even in this conversation, you know, it's giving people permission to say, "Yo, I was depressed too," or "Yeah, mm -hmm. I felt blah." You know, mm -hmm. just because you see two women of color that looks like you. Um, and for all ten, all intense purpose, we're not, you know, we're not crazy, right? And so it's okay to to talk about um, things um, that we learned that wasn't okay. So I definitely mm -hmm. think that there's just there just needs to be like an internal healing that happens, and I think that um, that would be great, y'all. Y'all, let's make it happen. 
Yeah, I agree. I think, um, you know, just to add to that, though, you know, because, you know, I'm very much a proponent of um, health insurance access for all. So I think this fee for service system is inherently broken and it it really does make it difficult for providers. Like you said, it, it ties your hands in so many ways in terms of what you're able to do because you're not, it's not really patient centered or patient focused and you're not really able to kind of do the real work of prevention of disease and, you know, that therapeutic healing and on the Alliance and spend the time on relationships because of the way that the system is structured that really forces you to move through people so quickly and so superficially. Right. So I think while I would love to like do something like that, if we're still going to be beholden to insurance companies, I, you know, financially it's, it's always going to be a challenge, right? There's so many kind of small private practices that try to kind of focus on quality. And then the, the result is that, you know, they just can't keep the lights on because unfortunately you kind of have to, you know, have volume in order to really be able to pay your staff. So mm -hmm. that part, I think, I think when there is like a dramatic shift in healthcare, and I feel like there's more opportunities to really practice uh, clinical care in a different way, you know, in a different, without having to really be focused on the time and, um, and rushing through and the reimbursement mm -hmm. where you just kind of get everybody, you know, you just, your clinic gets funded to be able to run itself and to provide good care for people, right? Regardless of what they're there for. Um, it's going to be, it's going to be a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's so many moving parts that need to be taken mm -hmm. care of. I think, mm -hmm. you know, in a utopia would be perfect, but I think that right now, all we know is what we've known. And I mm -hmm. just think that, um, and I don't know the answer to it, but I always feel like sometimes just stepping away from how we've been doing things and see what other possibilities are there. I don't know yeah. what that looks like, but yeah. I just know that this system doesn't work. Like the performance based mm -hmm. reimbursement doesn't work, mm -hmm. you know, um, mm -hmm. pushing patients out. I mean, I worked inpatient as well in mm -hmm. one of the city hospitals and it was just as, it was even more so difficult because we had to expedite the care, you know, mm -hmm. um, for patients that were really very still fragile, but enough, mm -hmm. you know, to get out. Um, and, uh, they, you know, and then we're trying to, then, then what happens is now the clinic are, are, are getting more unstable patients, right? Mm -hmm. You're, mm -hmm. you're the, that 15 minutes is not even possible because this patient really is supposed to be in the hospital. Um, right. They're not stable enough. So mm -hmm. it's just this vicious cycle and everybody is losing and I don't know what the answer is, but I just want to get off of this rat race and see what can we create, you know, then I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what that looks like. But the yeah. insurance needs us too, you know. I don't know what that looks like, but I don't think it could be the way it is now. It's not working for yeah. anyone. Yeah, not Healthcare at all. Healthcare providers burnt out. Patients are sicker, you know. So it, nobody's nobody's winning. Right. Well, my dear, I so appreciate having this um, conversation with you today. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you to everyone who joined us. Um, if you guys want to. Uh, follow Katie Ann. Um, she is at Next Level Shift and uh, underscore NP. So please do follow her and her work um, as she's doing a lot of work around um, inner healing as well. Um, and we'll see you all next week for another edition of interview another uh, important person who's doing a lot of amazing work with uh, communities of color around health. And you all have a wonderful Friday. Thank you Stay so dry. much. Bye, <laughs> thank, thank you. All right, bye.